All righty. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Jared. I probably should have introduced myself before, before I just seemed like a crazy person getting up here and just doing stuff. But if we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm Jared, and alongside my wife, Beth, we are the location pastors here at our city location. And, um, and it's been, like, it's been great. We've been in this building, in this space for a few months now. Before that, we were in Galaxy Cinemas. How many people were there at Galaxy, you know, back in the day? Yeah, how many people were at Landmark before that? How many people were at Maxwell's before that? A couple hands, yeah. Praise God that we're in here today, eh? Yeah? <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to be here. Listen, we are in uh, a book of the Bible. We've been talking about it for the last five weeks. It's called Ephesians. And I'm excited to unpack, we're in our, our second last week, so we got a little bit more today and then uh, some next week. And I mean, I don't know if you've been enjoying this, this book study, but I've been finding that Ephesians is a book that I, a lot of what we say as, as followers of Jesus comes out of. We get the whole idea of um, the, the fivefold ministry out of Ephesians, the apostles and the evangelists, the prophets, the gifts that God has given his church. We get so much of our own unity and submission out of this book, and we talk about it often, and I've been familiar with it for a lot of my life, but as we've been studying it and taking our time with it, I feel like God has been revealing more and more and more about his nature and about my identity uh, being found in, in, in as a child of, of God. And have you been enjoying it? Like, you don't have to, you know, like, go nuts about it or anything. But just a nod of a head, yeah? It's been good. I've been marking my Bible up as we've been going through. And I want to encourage you, if you've got a Bible here with you this morning, physical Bibles, anybody bring a physical Bible here today? Just hold it up real quick so I can see. It's great. Awesome. I feel like more and more every week. And, um, and it's great to have a physical Bible because you get to see all the stuff we're talking about in context. And you can mark it up. If you don't have a physical Bible, you are not less than the people that brought a physical Bible. You can have it on your phone. We'll have it on the screen behind us. But today we're looking at um, chapter, uh, kind of a, a blend. The funny thing about the Bible is as it's translated... Um, you get all these different like sections that it's broken up into, right? So oftentimes it'll be like, here's a section, it'll have a title, a bunch of different verses, and we'll look at that section. Today, th it's funny, the way that they've broken up the sections, it doesn't actually flow with the thought that Paul has. And so we're going to look at the thought that Paul has, because as, you've been, as we've been reading this book, it's like one thought leads to the next thought, leads to the next thought, leads to the next thought. And so just a quick recap and overview of, of where we're at today so that as we unpack scripture, we're not just taking like an isolated portion and going like, what does this mean in the greater context? When you're reading your Bible, it's important to know like, where does this fit into the grand story of what God is doing, but also where does it fit in the book that I'm reading? We've got a lot to get through this morning. And so if you've got your Bible, you can open it to um, Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verse 17. So we're going to jump back. Last week, Pastor Nate actually preached on, on some of these verses towards the end of his message. He did a phenomenal job unpacking uh, the passage right before this. And, and this, this passage, it kind of, although we ended on the thought last week, we're going to pick the thought up here this week, and it's going to carry us through as we study this next portion of Scripture. And so chapter 5, verse 17, says this. It says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, Paul is saying, like, don't li live wise. Don't let yourself just kind of follow the, the patterns of the age, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, living wisely, giving uh, glory back to God, giving praise back to God, giving thanksgiving back to God. But even getting to this spot, like the, the series is called, um, we can just flip back to the series title really quickly. The book of Ephesians is broken up into three sort of uh, sections. is in our sit, walk, and stand. So the sitting idea is that we're sitting in the identity that we have as, as children of God. Paul starts the letter saying, hey, you're adopted, you're chosen, you're loved by God. God sees you, he values you. You're not just alone in the world, but there's a, there's a creator that loves you and has invited you to be part of their family. And that's the starting point that we have uh, with this book. And then Paul begins to unpack and explain. He says, because of this identity, live as wise. Let your beliefs about who you are and the reality of who you are actually affect the way that you live out your life. Now, I was thinking about this idea, and so much like a, a great analogy for this is like uniforms. Does anybody, did anybody have to wear a uniform in school growing up? Yeah, a couple of people at the back, a couple at the front. I do wear a uniform in school growing up. Nobody liked it. Everyone was trying to cheat the rules on the uniform. We were always getting in trouble. When I came here to Canada, the first job that I had was at TSC stores. Anybody remember TSC stores? It's now PV Mart, good old PV Mart. Yeah, come on, man. And, uh, and so TSC, basically, it's like a, it's like a, 
Home Depot for people that know what they're doing, basically. Like, it's like a next level of, like, it's not just for your average Joe. If you're going in there, you kind of need to know what's going on. They got all kinds of tractor parts and things like that. And when I moved to Canada, I was, I was 19 years old, and I, uh, I moved from Thailand, and I didn't have previous work experience, and I was just looking for a job anywhere. And TSC was hiring, and so I went and I applied, and we did an interview, and uh, I kind of blocked that whole thing out of my life. But they gave me a uniform at the end of the interview. And they said, okay, you got the job. And so go buy yourself some black pants and some steel toe boots. And here's your shirt. It was this big black and red shirt. And I would put that shirt on. And when I put that shirt on, I was a tractor man. I was the man of TSC. You could come and you could ask me anything. And I would not know what to tell you. But I would either make something up or I would go to the computer and look it up. I remember one day a guy came in and he said, um, you know, man. That job was so tough. So many people would come in and ask me specific questions, and I wouldn't know what to do. You'd have, like, Mennonites coming in asking for, like, very specific parts for their tractor. I'm like, brother, I don't, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know where to find that part. And I remember one, one guy came in, and he was like, hey, I need, um, I need some sod. And I was so sick of feeling dumb all the time, like, when people would come in. I was like, I'm just going to meet this guy with, like, confidence. And I was like, how many bags of sod do you need? And he's like, what? I said, how many bags? How many bags of sod do you need? And he's like, no, I need, I need sod. And I was like, yeah, I know, how many bags of sod? Like, I'm sick of this, man. Like, how many bags do you need? He's like, it comes in rolls. And I just like, oh, my God. (laughs) I can't even fake my way through this. But you put on a uniform and you gain some kind of identity, right? It's like, oh, I'm the TSC store guy. And I I know what's going on. and, and uniforms, like, it, this, what we believe about ourselves actually, like, changes the way that we interact and we behave. I, I read about this in, in sociology where um, this is, like, a really terrible example of this. But uh, during, like, the Third Reich in Nazi Germany, people would do atrocious things because they had this uniform on. And they would put on this uniform and they say, this is my identity now, and, and almost remove themselves from, from the acts. And so identity is a, a really powerful thing in the way that we respond. If you want to change your life and you change your habits, one of the underlying things about changing your habits is changing change what you believe about yourself. If I want to change this thing, I have to say, if I want to work out more, I can't just put on the calendar, work out today, check mark. I've got to go, I'm the kind of person that values my physical health. And as that kind of person, I'm going to go and do this. They say it a lot with smoking, right? Where it's like, I'm a smoker, I'm non-smoker. And they say, you've got to change your identity around this thing if you want to change your behavior. And, and, and God lays out and he says, I'm not just giving you a, a, a uniform to wear or a costume like a doctor or, or a paramedic or anything like this. He says, I'm, I'm giving you a new identity from the inside out, from your deepest parts of who you are. This isn't a covering for who you are. I'm telling you that you are my child. Outside of anything that you do, what you think makes you valuable because you're fit or because you have a good job or because you got a healthy marriage from the outside or healthy kids or whatever that looks like, God says, that's not what gives you value. I've placed value on you. The identity that I give you is what makes you valuable. And then out of that, he encourages us to say, okay, given this identity, now walk that out in your life. And this is what we've been talking about the last few weeks. How do we actually walk out this identity? If we believe that deeply, how do we actually begin to change our our behavior and transform it? And the tricky thing about behavior transformation is that you can do it on the outside without having the right motivation. This is what we were picking at last week of, hey, you actually have to do all the right things, not from a place of, I want to do all the right things and look like the good Christian life and come in and smile on a Sunday morning and just suppress all the stuff in my life, don't ever talk about it, and just push it all down. No, no, no. We actually want to deal with these things so that the overflow of our life is the fruits of the Spirit in our lives, right? And this is what Paul is getting. He says, live as wise, not giving yourself over to the ideologies and the mentalities and the behaviors of the day. When he's writing to Ephesus, so much of that culture was so like sexually deviant and immoral. And we unpacked this last week, and Paul is saying there's a different way to live with your bodies. We're calling you to a different standard because of the identity that God has placed in you. And so Paul begins to unpack this, and he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. How can you possibly just change your life? Even if you understand your identity, there's still work to be done in the change of the way that we operate. And Paul says, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not expected to do this alone. Not only does God give you a new identity... But he also gives you the ability to do this stuff in your life. He gives you the strength to do it, the strength to outwork it. And as we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us, then we begin to actually have the the, the strength to change and adjust and to shift our, our life and our behaviors. So Paul has kind of shared all of this with the church in Ephesus. And then he gets to this passage where he says, as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, as you invite God to change and to transform you, he gives this analogy where he says, don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. As you're reading the Bible, it's good to ask questions. Ask questions that you know the answer to or questions you don't know the answer to. And as I was reading, I asked the question, like, Paul, 
of all the things that you could have, like, compared the Holy Spirit to, why does Paul choose to compare the Holy Spirit, like, contrast it with being drunk on wine? Right? We just talked about sexuality. He could have said, like, don't murder, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He could have said, like, don't steal, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He could have said anything else. Why did he choose drunk on wine? Well, it's interesting because when you're, when you're drunk, when you're intoxicated, you're giving yourself over to something else. Right? You, you still have some level of cognitive awareness, but you've, you've submitted yourself to, okay, I'm going to be intoxicated, and I'm not going to be like, sober-minded. I'm not going to be fully aware, but I'm going to give myself over to this. And Paul says, that's like, don't do that. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit doesn't take over us or possess us or anything like that. But the Holy Spirit fills us and, and changes and transforms us. And if we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, then we actually see fruit in our life and change in our life. So Paul is comparing these two things. He says, in a similar way, don't, don't do what the world does and fill yourself up with, with wine and be drunk and lose your, your cognitive ability and just go to the, the, the whims of your flesh. But be filled with the Spirit. In contrast with that, give yourself over, submit yourself to the Holy Spirit to change and transform your life. And Paul says, when you do that, what happens? What's the fruit of that? Well, I mean, for those of us that have read other sections of Scripture, Paul, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is, can anybody rattle them off? It's like subtle whispers. I don't know if you're getting it right. It's like happiness. <laughs> I listened to this song uh, every night going to sleep. It was like a, a track, and they just sang, like, scripture. And 90% of the scriptures that I have memorized are from this song growing up. And one of them was about the fruits of the Spirit. But Paul says the fruits of the Spirit, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the evidence of the Spirit in your life. If you're wondering, like, man, do I have the Holy Spirit active and at work in me? Begin to write some of those things down and go, is this outworking in my life? And if it is, I'm probably submitting myself to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not an exhaustive list of the fruit of the Spirit. There's more fruit to be had from giving ourselves over to the Spirit's work in our life. And Paul begins to outline that for us here. And he says this. He says, you're going to sing to one another. This praise is going to be coming out. You're going to give thanksgiving back to God as you realize and you're filled with the Spirit of God that is demonstrating to you the love that God has for you. The, the response is, is praise and thanksgiving back to God. And then he says, you're singing, you're, you're thanksgiving, all this stuff. And then Paul throws this line in, and this is what we're going to unpack today. Paul throws this line in. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. As you're thanksgiving and as you're praising God and as you're doing all of these things, part of a fruit of the Spirit is you're actually submitting yourself to those around you. You're submitting to one another out of a reverence for Christ. We'll talk about that reverence for Christ, Christ in a minute. But this is one of the fruit of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit is a submission to one another, which immediately begs the question, okay, I can see why love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, all that stuff is good. Why is submission good? Why does Paul care about submission? In fact, why does God care about submission? Like for us today, if part of what God has asked me to do is submit to one another, and what is submission? Submission is this idea of, of not thinking first about yourself, but going, how do I actually serve those around me? How do I look to the people around me and live my life in service to them, live my life in service to God, but also to the people that are a part of my life, to the people in my home base, to the people in my church, to the people in my family? What does it look like to, to submit our life? And, and Paul kind of sits on this idea of submission. In the next 20 verses, which is what we're going to go through this morning, those 20 verses, what he's basically doing is he's outlining a bunch of different depictions or examples of submission. But it's all around this idea of we're submitting ourselves to one another. Why is submission significant? Why is it important? Like, you've got to ask yourself these questions as opposed to just, like, reading it. So as, as I'm asking myself this, I go, God, like, why is, that, why is that significant? Well, if you look at the heart posture of God and you look at his heart towards us, you see that in, in the character of God is, is this love and compassion and desire to serve and desire to um, sub, submit himself to, to us as creation. You see this in the life of Jesus, that the, the one that had all the authority and power lowered himself to the lowest place so that, not that he would come to be served, but that he would serve others. So it's part of the nature and the character of God. So for us as followers of Jesus, as we want to become more like God, we have to be more submitted to one another. So God, I actually want, I want to live my life in, in the example that you've set, so I'm going to submit myself to the people around me. Submission also picks away and it cuts against the grain of our selfishness as people. You see, sin, the underlying thing with sin is selfishness. 
right? When God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, he creates the garden, he creates Adam and Eve, he says, everything that you have, I've given you everything to enjoy and to find pleasure in, but don't eat this one fruit. He leaves them one opportunity to, to, to choose to submit themselves back to God. But what Adam and Eve do? They eat the fruit just like we would eat the fruit, just like anybody would eat the fruit, because at our core is brokenness and selfishness, and selfishness ushers in sin into the world. And you go like, well, selfishness just seems like something that's a part of a lot of other things, part of pride, part of greed, part of envy, all, jealousy, all these different things that we see as, as sin in Scripture. But selfishness as, is at the root of, of all of that stuff. And Paul recognizes selfishness runs deep in people because God recognizes selfishness runs deep in people. It's the root of, of sin. If you look at our society today, I, I began to think about this as like, how does selfishness outwork in our lives? How does selfishness outwork in, in, our, in our culture, in our society? The foundational structure that we have um, as a society is capitalism. And the, the idea behind capitalism is that everybody will work to maximize their own pleasure. And as you do that, corporations will arise. And as corporations will arise in a free market, they'll work, they work it out so that the most efficient prospers and it meets the needs of the people. But the whole thing is founded on this idea of maximizing your personal utility. I did economics throughout university. And I focused on microeconomics because I was curious about the way that people's brains worked and how they made choices about whether they buy this shirt or that shirt or go to this store or that store. And the foundational principle in microeconomics is a, a, an individual will do everything that they can to maximize their utility from something, to maximize the way that something will serve them. And I remember doing all these like Pareto, like finding Pareto efficiency on all of these graphs of where does the demand and, and the supply and where does the person interact with the supply of those things to gain for themselves the most that they can gain for themselves. Like the whole foundation of, of our structure in our society is built on serving self, and building up self. You think about it like you pick up any kind of like vertical in our society, any kind of thing like the clothing industry, Right. I mean, the clothes in our closet would probably last us for the next 15 to 20 years if we just took care of them, yeah? Like, realistically. I mean, some of this stuff is pretty cheaply made. If you're buying off of Shein or something like that, good luck. You're going to be struggling about next year. But for most, like, clothes that we purchase, if we take care of it and we wash it and we, like, invest in it, it's going to make it for quite a while, right? I look in my own closet and I'm like, I could not buy clothes again until my children are, like, grown and out of my house. But what do we do? We consume. We go, I need more of this. I, I don't feel good, and it's an old style. You know, the culture has told me that every season I got to go and buy. I knew somebody that had, like, um, I'm not even going to get into that. I don't need to dog on him. Um, <laughs> it's, like, not important. But, like, the, the culture and the mentality is, like, hey, we got we to gotta get the next, the next, the next, the next, the next. And because of our, our own, like, ego, pride, selfishness, our own focus on self, there are other people that pay the consequence for those decisions. Right, I heard it said once that slavery is still alive and well in the West. We've just shipped it overseas. It's like it exists in the world, but like the people that are making the clothes often that we're wearing are not being paid a living wage in Canada or uh, in, in a healthy environment. And they're all often not of age to be working in, in conditions that they're working in. And so often we don't think about that. We just sort of push that aside and go, no, I need a new pair of pants. <laughs> I need a new pair of shoes. I got to keep up. I, I need more for, for myself. And, and it comes at the cost of, of other people. You look at like any kind of, uh, of segment of this. You look at this is what like pornography is pervasive in our society. And it's the clearest example of like I am going to derive something for myself at the expense of other people. At great expense to other people. For marginal gain to myself. But in our sinfulness and in our brokenness, that's what logically we're like, we got to do this thing. I got I to gotta acquire, I got to feed this beast that's inside of me at the expense of those around me. Paul says, an outworking of the spirit in your life cuts against all of that stuff. An outworking of the spirit in your life is to lay yourself aside and go, how do I actually serve the people around me? How do I submit my life for the betterment of those that are, that are around me? Part of my church community, part of my home base, part of my family, part of my friend group. How do I, how do I, and, and the question that I began to ask myself is like, how many of the thoughts that run through my mind are not focused on me? Just ask yourself that for a second here. In this past week, how many thoughts did you have that weren't focused on you? Sometimes I have thoughts about other people, but they're still focused on me. I wonder what that person thinks about me. I hope that that gift made it to that person on their birthday so that they don't think I'm a bad person. <laughs> I hope that this thing that I did to benefit that person actually ultimately turns back to, to benefit me. It's so interesting. And we don't see that in the, in the heart of God. And Paul's cutting against this idea. He says, listen, we actually have to submit ourselves to one another. Um, 
and this is like an, an outworking of the, of the fruit of the Spirit in our life. So Paul then begins to unpack what submission looks like. And Paul has done this already in this letter. He's driving after unity. He's driving after bringing people together. He's saying, hey, we're not individualistic, but as the church of Jesus Christ, we're all members of this body to be used to outwork the, the, the mission and the goal of the body. In Ephesians 4, we read this through uh, before. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So he's, he, he, Paul is already outlining, he's, hey, there's different roles and responsibilities that you guys have, and you have a responsibility to submit those gifts back to one another. Those that, that can encourage. I mean, I'm not a naturally encouraging person. I think I, I have a, a, a really critical mind a lot of the time, and um, it's probably the number one feedback I get from Beth is like, I could just use some encouragement right now. And I'm like, I don't have time to think about that. I got broken stuff in the house I got to fix. And but the reality is, like, it's not, it's not natural. I have to work at encouragement. But, man, I know, um, uh, Nick, your mom, Rebecca Ferguson, is, like, one of the most encouraging people I've ever met in my entire life. Like, I was sitting in, uh, in church the other day, and uh, in, the, in the evening service, I sat beside her. I was like, hey, how's it going? Good. And so we chatted, and then I just sat there, and I was just kind of, like, looking around. And she had pulled her phone out, and I, like, saw just, I wasn't looking over her shoulder. I just happened to see that she was texting, and at the top was Beth. And she just then, I was like, oh, what's she going to say, Beth? And then I started looking over her shoulder to read what it was. <laughs> and it was the nicest, most encouraging message I've ever seen. She's like, hey, sitting with Jared tonight, thinking about you. Hope you're doing well with the kids. Love you so much. Would love to get together sometime. I'm like, wow, what a sweet thing to do. What a kind thing to do. And that gift that she has, like, she's so great at being open-handed with that and submitting that back to others and saying, I'm not going to, because that's a vulnerable thing to do to encourage somebody. I went out of my way uh, last night because I saw somebody do something really amazing. Um, we were, I'll just tell you who it is because it's an encouragement. Um, but we were at the Weber's house, Josh and Ashley. And Josh and Ashley are fantastic. And Josh is a good dad, and he loves his kids, and he was so welcoming, and all these other kids felt so welcomed and invited there. And I got home, and I was telling Beth about it. I was like, man, Josh is doing such a good job as a dad. And, um, and she's like, yeah. And then we just kind of, like, left it there, and I was like, dude, I should tell him this. And so I get my phone out and I text him. And I'm like, Josh, you're a great dad, man. Like you've made all those kids feel so welcome and you're really pouring into your kids. And, and that's so cool. And then I put the phone away and immediately I'm like, oh, I'm such a loser. Like, why did I say that? He's going to think I'm weird. He's going to think I'm a creep. Like I was watching him with his kids. Da, da, da. I like go to bed and I'm like thinking, I wake up the next day and I'm still thinking about it. And he hasn't texted me back. And I'm like, man, he thinks I'm so weird. And like time goes by. Dude's just busy like hanging out with his kids. And then he like messages me back. He's like, thanks, man. That's like the best encouragement. And I was like, okay, good. He doesn't think I'm nuts. Or maybe he does still, but... Submitting costs something, right? Like it costs us like our pride and our ego to encourage. And your mom does that such, so well, right? And, and those that can teach, like those that have a gift to teach the word of God, like submit that. Be a part of, 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 um, of base essentials and, and, and teaching people in our community. Go for coffees with people and teach them about the word of God. Those that have this, uh, this gift of prophecy to say like God is still at work and to encourage those around them with the good things that God is still doing. Use that. Speak those things out. Paul's saying submit all of this to one another. Paul is also saying, here's what else submission looks like. And he begins to look at the different makeups of a household. And he says, here, in each of these different verticals, this is what the outworking of the gospel in your life and submission looks like. So we're going to read that through. And the reason I, I want to kind of frame all of that is because this, the passage is actually probably familiar to a lot of people. And immediately when we read it, there's some things in that passage that spark question or, or frustration. Or ha this passage has often been used to belittle people or to hurt people because they're taking this idea of submission and they're just like slamming it on people as opposed to outworking it in the way that God has designed it. So I want to reframe it all for us before we read it. So let's read the passage that we're going to talk about today. Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, verse 9. Submit to one another... Out of reverence for Christ. This is his call for submission. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ. Uh, is, it, is there like an echo on what I'm saying? Can everybody? No? Sorry, it's just throwing me off. I'm like Pastor Brandon in these things. I got to focus here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church 
So we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and, he, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Or another translation says, don't provoke your children to anger. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. And masters... Treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So that's the passage. It's a nice light passage. No questions coming out of that passage. But this is what Paul, Paul gives us. Paul gives us three sets of relationships. The husband and wife, the child and the parent, the slave and the master. I was going to at this point go like, sort of a choose your own adventure, which one do you want to tackle first, because we've got all of them prepared. But we're actually going to talk first about slaves and masters, because that's the one that's like, is Paul condoning slavery here? What, what Paul's doing in this passage is he's not, he's not speaking to, like at the time, slaves and masters were a common uh, element to like the Roman household. So you'd have like your family, and then you'd have basically like the people that worked in and amongst your house, and then you'd have the ones that are overseeing those that work. And, and the reality is like sometimes people will take this passage and go like, it's like employees and employers, which kind of is true, but not really in the sense that these were still slaves. They were still owned by the house. They weren't free. They weren't able to make their own decisions about their life. They were still property. And, and again, so it's like, okay, cool. Paul is instructing in this, in this way, like slaves and masters. Is Paul condoning slavery? No. What Paul's doing in this passage is he's not, he's not trying to, like, uh, give a social commentary on the makeup of, of the Roman household at the time. What he's doing is he's, he's telling everybody, in the context you find yourself, this is how you live out the truth of the gospel in your life. So he's, he's not saying, like, this is good or this is bad. He's saying, in the context, this is how you live out the truth of the gospel in your life. So then the question becomes, like, well, does the rest of it apply then? Because, like, if this is a context that we don't hold in society today anymore, and praise God, we don't, does, do we have to then obey, like, the wives and husband thing and the, the children and parents thing? Like, do we just throw it all out? No, because what we see in God's design is that the husband and the wife is part of God's design for creation. The child and the parent is part of God's design for creation. We don't see the slave and the master as part of God's design for creation. But Paul still speaks to it because he recognizes so many of the people reading it, that's going to be their reality. So they go, how do I live the gospel? Do I run away? My first allegiance is to God, so I just abandon this? No, Paul says this is how you live this out in submitting yourself to one another. Does that make sense? Cool. And again, th there's so much here to unpack in a short period of time. So if you've got more questions, like dialogue with somebody. Talk to your home base leader. Talk to me after the service. I'd love to get into more of this stuff with you. But let's look at slaves and masters first. Because in each of these relationship pairs, we can learn something about submission. And, um, and if you're not in one of these pairs, don't, like, tune out. Like, any, any slaves in the room today? <laughs> no, praise God. <laughs> any masters in the room today? No, praise God. But that doesn't mean we can't learn something from the passage here as Paul is describing what it looks like to submit to one another, right? So Paul says, slaves, work is unto the Lord. The principle that, that Paul is getting at here is, like, listen, respect your masters. It, it says, um, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Paul is, is working out this parallel. The, the designation that you've been given, the job that you've been given in front of you, do that job well and do it with respect and do it with honor as unto the Lord. Paul is outlining already, like ultimately, your responsibility and your accountability at the end of your life is to God, not necessarily your household or your earthly master, but that accountability is to God. So work as unto the Lord in all that you do. Don't just work for your benefit. He says don't just do what benefits you because oftentimes if, you, you know, a slave worked hard enough, they could get a high uh, position in the household or they could, they could often make a wage and then that wage could be used to buy their, free, buy their freedom. And Paul is saying even though those are good things, don't work with that motivation. Work to respect and to love and to honor your master and do it all as unto the Lord because that's where your first priority is. Um, and he says here, God rewards the slave and the free for whatever good they do. And, and it's interesting, God begin, or God, well, yeah, God, through Paul. God begins to break down these, these structures um, in society at the time. He says, um, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from their dear heart, 
uh, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. Paul is saying, like, whether you're a slave or whether you're free, it's God who's rewarding the work that's being done. Whether your master sees it or not. And this is where we can pull this out, and it actually does kind of apply to the workplace a little bit, right? Where it's like, cool, don't, don't work at your job to gain the, the, the eye of the person that's leading you. But work as unto the Lord. Bring the best that you have and submit yourself to say, I'm going to show up every day with a good attitude and a good perspective and a good heart because this is where God has placed me right now. That's the submission piece. I'm not going in it for myself to go, how do I climb the ladder and make more money? How do I benefit the, those that I'm, I'm submitted to in my workplace? Masters. Um, it says for masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no favoritism with him. Paul is undercutting this and he's like, hey, you have a position of authority over these slaves and the way that you submit to them is you treat them with respect. At the time, you didn't need to, but, but again, you, have, you both have a master in heaven and he's equal. He equals the playing field and he says he's gonna give you the same perspective that he's gonna give them. He's not gonna carry this, oh, you were the master of slaves into heaven, but you're equal in the eyes of God. So Paul is beginning to, to break down these like uh, authority structures while also s- supporting them. It's so interesting. Submit yourself to one another, but remember that this is just earthly. This is just here and now, and ultimately the authority is with God. Slaves and masters. There's so much more that I have here, but we're f- short on time. Parents and children. This is an interesting one. Any children in the room? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> this is a slow burn for some. But, um, but oftentimes we think about this in, like, the perspective of, like, kids, right? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right and pleasing unto God. This was one of those uh, songs that I heard growing up. It's clever. My parents chose the right songs. But, um, but that passage, like, obey your parents. But, but then you go, like, well, really, what, what God is saying here is honor your father and mother. And Paul notes this. He says, like, this is the first commandment. Well, what commandment? Well, it's the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments. This Ten Commandments, this like original ideology of, like, of the law of this is how you're to live your life. This is what Paul gives the, uh, or God gives Moses. And the fifth one, the first one that talks about interrelationship with human beings is honor your father and mother. It's significant. What God is doing when he gave the Ten Commandments is establishing the importance of the family unit. The importance of the household, the importance of the child and the parent. And I know for many of us in the room today, like the reason God notes that it's important is because he's designed it to be important. Everybody here, like whether you have a good relationship with your parents or a bad relationship with your parents or there's been pain or hurt or it's just been awesome, which everybody has pain and hurt, like it's a significant relationship. And God is noting that the responsibility of the child throughout their life is to honor their parent. And what, what does honor mean? It's to assign them great value and to act accordingly. It doesn't mean that we just have to do whatever our parents say. No, it's a difference between um, blind obedience and, and honoring our, our parents. Does it mean that we have to live with no boundaries in the relationships with our family? No, that's also not what Paul is saying. Does it mean that we can cut off our family in its entirety? No, it doesn't mean that. Maybe we don't, we don't see them. I don't know this situation because there, there may be situations of abuse and things like that, and Paul is not inviting people back into abusive relationships. But what he is saying is that there's, there, we have to have a heart and a love and a compassion for our parents. We have to honor them. And even if the situation is it is most healthy to not have interactions with them, then the posture as children is to I actually need to pray for my parents then and desire that God would restore relationships. I have an example of this in a friend of mine who um, felt that God was calling them to do something, and they went and they did that thing. And for nearly a decade, they were, they were outworking that in their life, and their dad had a real big problem with that. And so for a decade, they just didn't, talk to them. Their father didn't talk to them, didn't engage with them, refused to have any kind of communication or, or contact. And I watched this person walk through that for nearly a decade and go like, be so torn up about it and struggle and be angry and be hurt and be frustrated and have every reason in the world to just go, okay, I'll just reciprocate that intentionality like back to my dad. And in the conversation over time, I, I watched them wrestle with that to go, no, that's not the heart of God. And it's not actually what God is calling me to do to submit myself to them. And, and I watched them pray for years and years and years and continue to invite relationship and open door of opportunity and, and to wrestle with the impact that it has on their life. And, um, and after 10 years of this, just in the last five years or so, I've seen that relationship pretty well be completely restored. And that dad actually come back and say, I'm sorry for the way that I treated you in that time. I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. and I took that out on you and it was wrong but thank you for the way that you continued to like create space. And, and there was real like deep conversation and tears. And I remember them telling me about it and going, wow, look what God can do as we submit ourselves to one another. Because that person had every right in the world to go, all right, dad, that's it. We're done talking. But in that submission, it leaves space for reconciliation. 
right? And that's what God wants to do. He wants to reconcile all of these dynamics and relationships. I know the band is coming up, but you're going to have to wait a little bit here because we're not even at husbands and wives yet. Parents is short. Don't make your kids angry unnecessarily. Um, that's basically what it says. Instruct them. Teach them. Um, if you've ever seen Iron Claw, the movie about the Von Erich family, don't do that. Just don't provoke your kids to anger. Wives and husbands. Don't play any music yet, though, because this is going to be uncomfortable as I talk about wives and husbands if you're playing soft, gentle music behind. <laughs> wives and husbands. This is the big one. Wives, submit to your husbands as the head of the household. Husbands, love your wives. As we approach this passage, we've got to understand the context in which Paul was writing it and the context in which we're reading it today because they're really different. When Paul is writing it, he's writing it to a context where the patriarchy is, like, alive and well. And the patriarchy in its original, like, sense and where the, the eldest male of the home held all of the power and all of the authority. Women at the time that Paul is writing this didn't, uh, they were considered citizens in the Roman Empire, but they didn't have the ability to vote. They didn't, uh, in many places, have the ability to own property. They were often seen as property of either a father, and then when they got married, that, that property and that ownership transferred to a husband. And so Paul's writing this, and at the time that he's writing it, for Paul to say, "Wives, well, submit yourself to your husband, which is basically what he says. It's kind of like a passing comment, given how much he talks to the husband. He says, like, submit yourself to one another, wives, to your husbands. And, and, and nobody would have blinked at that. In fact, the, the, the way that Paul then begins to expand on the way that the husband is to love their wife was extremely countercultural at the time. He said, husband, you actually have to lay down your life. The same way that Christ loved the church, husband, that's the way that you lay down your life, that would have been the sticking point. Like if somebody was teaching this or preaching this at the time, that would have been the sticking point at the time. Now, the, the, the time that we live in, we've seen, like obviously the patriarchy outworking in its fullness. The roots of that is selfishness. It's greed. It's power. It's desiring for the most that we can acquire um, because of our, our, our title and our position. Then you have like a, a social movement uh, in, in university, my, my minor was in social. We did this whole class on feminism and the different waves of feminism, how it outworks. And you have feminism comes, and it kind of brings in these different stages. And the first wave of feminism focused on uh, giving women the right to vote and to be considered voting members of society, which is a great thing. And then you have the second uh, wave of feminism that begins to talk about gender roles and, in the home, and it talks about uh, abuse, and it talks about autonomy over the body. And as followers of Jesus, this is where, you know, the... the the most of it is like, hey, this is great, and some of it is going, ah, is this what the Bible says, or is this what society says? And then, and then you have third wave, and, and what is recently being called since like the early 2010s is the fourth wave of feminism, where you're taking all of these thoughts and ideas to the extreme. And, and on both ends, you have extremes where people are being oppressed, and then you have on the other extreme where it's going, hey, men and women are completely equal in all fronts, in all uh, ways of society, and, and there's no conversation about that anymore. You can't talk about it. You can't have a counterthought. And that, now what, what that ideology has brought in its own selfishness and promotion to say, hey, these people are powerful in, in their own right. It's selfishness on both sides. And what it leaves us with is a spot where um, in its fullness, like there's, there's biological males competing in biological female sports and dominating in that space. It leaves us in a culture and a society where asking the question, what is a woman or what is a man? We can't even answer these things. And the struggle is like, I don't, I don't know. And, and we feel handcuffed in this stuff. And in both senses... It's not what the Bible outlines for us. In both senses, it's, it's rooted in brokenness. It's the world trying to figure out how do we interact with one another. Because if we just leave it to the, the patriarchy, we see like a domineering, oppressive, violent. If we leave it to, to the, the, fem, the movement of feminism, who knows where that goes? Like we, we're living in the, the extent of, of drawing that thought out to its furthest conclusion. And Paul is writing to say, hey, this is not, neither of these is what God has. What God has is unique, and it's different, it's designed. And he gives this picture of Christ in the church. And he says, in the mix of all of this stuff. So, like, you can see now that the context Paul's writing is literally the opposite of the context we're reading in. Right? And so as we approach this, we go, okay, Paul, what are you getting at? Because neither of them are holding the weight that we desire as people. Both of them seem to have ideas, but, but they're, they're lacking. So what are you getting at? And Paul outlines the relationship between the church and Jesus as the one that's to be modeled in the husband and wife. To say, like husbands, the, he, he lays it on here that you're actually to like give your life to love your spouse. That, that you need to look at your, your heart posture and the selfishness of, that we have as, as, as men to go, you have to give that up and to take on loving your wife. And, and wives, you actually have to submit yourself to your husbands. Now in this passage, there's two big words that cause uh, pause. It's the word submit and the word head. What do those mean? Submission isn't a bad thing in the way that Paul is outlining it here. This is obviously what we've been talking about this whole morning, submission. You see submission in the life of Jesus. 
Jesus submits himself to the will of the Father. Jesus comes to earth and he says, I'm not coming to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. Does that mean that Jesus is less than or less God than the Father is? No. The belief of the Trinity is that they're co-equal. They're both God. They play different roles and different functions. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks what Jesus has spoken. There's a submission of the Holy Spirit back to Christ. Does that mean the Holy Spirit is less God than Jesus or the Father? No. It's not less value. It's just a different role and a different function. And, and, and honestly, the, the submission, this is the whole passage. Although Paul says, like, submit to your husbands, this is what all of this is talking about, is all of us picking up and submitting to one another. So that idea of submission, it's not, it's not um, a less than thing, or to denote, like, you are less than your, your spouse. You see it in the life of Jesus. And when it comes to submission, it's, not, it's, it's to be chosen. The wife is actually to choose to submit, not to have their arm twisted or to be controlled into submitting, as oftentimes we've seen it in the past, but there's, a, there's an active choice by the woman to submit in that relationship dynamic. Now, again, the passage is describing an ideal scenario. It's not talking about um, an abusive relationship. It's not talking about a situation where there's actual harm. There's no um, call to compromise, like, ethically, morally, or physically, like, for a woman to compromise those things, because, again, the first allegiance is to God. So a really, like, easy example of this is, like, you pick the phone up, and it's like, oh, hey, Johnny, how's it going? Oh, you're looking for Rick. Uh, and then Rick calls from the other room, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> you don't have to lie. <laughs> you can say, yeah, he's in the other room. You want to talk to him? Like, the, there's the reality is, like, you don't actually have to compromise your morality to submit yourself to your husband. But Paul is talking in, in ideals here. In the best case scenario, the wife is submitting as the husband loves the wife and doesn't ever put them in those positions to compromise those things. So Paul is not... Uh, it's not like saying you have to die at the hands of your husband because of, of a brokenness or immorality there. Paul is actually inviting people to remove themselves from, from danger. But in, in the best situation, there's a submission and a, and a leadership. Head is the next word that's kind of like a sticking point. And it's, and it's intended to communicate some kind of, of leadership role in and amongst the husband and the wife. The idea really is like when you have two leaders, you have no leaders. At the end of the day, like somebody needs to make a final decision on things. And oftentimes... Uh, when Beth and I are having conversations on things and I'm struggling, I'm going like, man, I don't know what to do here. What do you think? Like there's a back and forth that we'll have. But if we disagree on something and, and a push comes to shove, honestly, we've never really gotten there in our, in our relationship before because of this mutual submission that happens. But the reality is like we've both kind of gone, okay, I've got to make the final call on that. And, and the reality is there's also an accountability and responsibility that's carried. This is why Paul sits so long on the situation for husbands. It's a command to love your wife, but to also step into this role of leadership and authority that God has designed in his infinite wisdom. And so that's what, that's what it, the, the headship isn't meant to lord over or be a position of, of coercion, but it's two parties choosing to submit themselves to one another, one out of, out of love and one out of respect. And Paul outlines all of this when it comes for a husband to love your wife, a wife to respect your husband. You guys can play now because I think I'm through like the, the tense part of it. But the love and, and the respect, like, I can guarantee almost every conversation, Beth and I say this all the time uh, when we're talking to our mentors or when we're having conversations with people that we mentor, almost every fight that we have comes down to me not feeling like she respects what I have to say and her not feeling like I love her, right? That's the baseline of every, all the arguments you can whittle them down to those things. I just feel like you, when I talk, you're not listening to me. Or I just feel like you don't really love me, like we're just in this together, we're just partners in this. And God knows the way that he designed us. God knows the way that we need to outwork these dynamics in our life and in our relationship. And the way that God has called me to love Bet is to lay down my life for her. The way that Christ loved the church, what kind of love does Christ have for the church? There's no greater love than this than he who would lay down their life for their friend. He actually gave his life for us. That's the kind of love that we're called into as husbands. I think in the room today, many of us like are going, man, there are some ways that I need to pick this up. I know for myself, when we first started dating, I was really the driver of, hey, we should pray together. We should read our Bible together. And the busyness of our life, that's kind of slipped to the wayside. And I've got a responsibility to lead our family in that, to go, hey, Beth, because oftentimes you'll bring it up and you'll be like, hey, we should pray together more. And I'm like, yeah, 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 we will, we will. <laughs> but that's like, you're carrying a weight that you don't need to carry there. That's my responsibility for me to pick that up and go, man, I actually need to drive this in our household. And for wives to love their husbands, to respect them, to encourage them, to be in their corner. The voice of a, of a wife in a husband's life is significant. There is no voice that I value more in this world than Beth's voice. The reason I grew this beard out is because one time Beth said, I like your beard. <laughs> you got it, baby. 
You want a beard? <laughs> the rest of my life, I'm wearing this thing. When Beth encourages me, I'm like, man, I can do anything. I feel like I got her in my corner. I know what's going on. But so often the enemy likes to take these things that God has designed to unify us and chip away at them and go, ah, man, just focus on yourself. Ah, your husband didn't do that thing again. Or ah, your wife is missing this thing or that thing. Or what the enemy will do is he'll often drive the husband's eye to other things. It's not that we don't love our wife. We just kind of forget in the busyness of all the stuff that goes on. And Paul is drawing us back in to say, wives, submit to your husbands in this role that God has given them. And husbands, step up to the call of loving your wife, of serving them, of putting your stuff aside. The thing about submission is it takes a laying down and a picking up of things. It t- submission takes laying down our own ego and our own pride and our own desires. And it means picking up the call that God has placed on our life. And Paul writes that call out in each of these different dynamics and relationships. For the wife, it's picking up a, a submission to the husband. For the husband, it's picking up the role of responsibility and accountability as they lead in the relationship. For the child, it's honoring and obeying their parents. For the parents, don't anger your child. For the slave, it's, it's work as unto the Lord. Respect your masters. For the masters, it's don't disrespect and harm, threaten your slaves. But each thing, it takes a laying down of ourselves and a picking up a responsibility that God has called us into. It takes a weightiness, and I think oftentimes where we get stuck is when we avoid the responsibility that God is calling us into. For whatever reason, whether that's a a conflict or a thought, or we pick up the ideology of the world around us, and we kind of push down what, what what Scripture is saying, or or maybe we just like forget, and we just live out of selfishness because so much of the world around us reminds us, hey, this is yours, and you deserve this, and you need to have this. But Paul is again, again and again and again saying, submit your life to one another. Although you have been given authority and privilege and power, whether you're a master, whether you're an employer, whether you're a husband, whether you're an adult, whatever that that position is, he's saying submit yourself regardless of that position for the benefit of those around you. And what greater example do we have of this other than Jesus? The one that had all authority, all power, all dominion, takes like the highest position. He says, I'm actually gonna remove myself from that and bring myself to the lowest position. Like we said, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Like imagine Jesus, there's nothing lower than that, right? He's beaten, he's whipped, he's naked, he's nailed to a cross. There's a group of people around him mocking him. Oh, you say you're the son of God, you pull yourself down from this tree. Like there's not a lower position than that. And that's just what we see in the physical. On top of that, Jesus is taking on all the brokenness and the sin so that we can be in relationship with him again. The one that had all authority submitted that authority so that, why? Like the Bible says, for the joy set before me endured the cross. What is the joy? Reconciliation and relationship with us so that we could be adopted into his family. This is what God outlines for us as the church. And this is what Paul says is choose again and again to submit yourself to one another in your role, in your gifts, in your relationships. What does that actually look like? Probably means apologizing to some people. Likely some people in our life that we've hurt or we've just chosen to do what we want to do and push them to the wayside and gone, man, I actually need to to apologize. I need to confess and say, hey, I'm sorry for what I did. It means means looking to people that uh, opening your eyes to those that aren't going to benefit you in the relationships in your life. Oftentimes we build friendships on those that are like-minded or can give us something. Oh, they got a cottage, so I'm going to be a friend with them because I need something to do on the weekends. But to look at those that are less than and say, hey, how do I actually invite them into my life? How do I serve them? It's to look at the people around us and say, what does it look like for me to submit and to serve and to value those that are part of the community that I'm in? Paul says, do this out of reverence for Christ, out of a respect for what Christ has done, seeing the example of Jesus and then living that out in your own life. Why don't we stand up this morning as we close and we can sing. I hope that out of this morning as we're talking about this idea of submission and being an outworking of the, the fruit of the Spirit in our life, that we begin to rest and go, okay, what are the areas in my life where I need to lay things down? And what are the areas in my life where I actually need to pick something up? Where I've been called to a responsibility that I've either been shirking or avoiding or minimizing? And what are the areas in my life where I actually need to submit myself and to say, God, apart from what I desire, I'm choosing to desire what you desire choosing to submit myself to your Holy Spirit, to your church, to those around me. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray for two two groups this morning as we we close here today. The first is anybody that hasn't heard how much God loves them, that he actually left heaven, 
came, took on flesh, lived a perfect life, died on the cross so that you could be reconciled into relationship with him. I wanna pray for anybody that hasn't recognized the identity that God is calling them into to be a son or a daughter of their family. And if that's you this morning, you're going, I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, to be adopted into this family of God, to recognize this gift of salvation that Jesus is offering this morning. With nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you today, I just wanna invite you to throw your hand up this morning. As an outward expression to say, hey, I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus today. Great, God, I pray for anybody making that decision here this morning. Just ask that you would meet them where they are, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for this gift of life and salvation, and we just pray that you would come alongside them, Lord, and that you would bring people alongside them to help them walk out this journey of faith in their life. In your name we pray, amen, amen. The last group I wanna pray for this morning is, is those of us here today that are going, man, I know I need to either pick something up, step into the responsibility that I'm called to, or lay something down, and release something I've been holding on to, but I just don't feel like I have the ability to do that myself. I've been doing it for years. I've been wrestling with it for years. It's the same conversation over and over and over again. And I need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit today to submit myself to the will of God in my life, to work and to move on my behalf. So again, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning, you're going, I need the Holy Spirit to meet me here this morning as I give this up or as I, as I desire the strength to pick up what he's called me to. Uh, with every head bowed, I just wanna invite you to raise your hand. This hand's going up already, but... My hand is up in this. I know that there are ways that I need to improve when it comes to leading my family. And I wanna pray for you this morning. God, I thank you that you haven't left us to outwork our lives alone. But God, you've given us the gift of your Holy Spirit. That if you would say, first, if you would submit yourself to me, I will meet you with what you need. God, and I know there are many needs in the room this morning. Are there some of us that need to step more wholeheartedly into the relationship that we have with you? There are some of us that need to let go of some of the things that we've been holding on to. There are those of us that need to make amends and reshape the way that we see our families and our parents and, and even our children. Maybe some of us are holding anger towards our children that you've not called us to, God. I pray that in those things we would be open-handed and release them back to you, Lord, that you would fill us as your church with your spirit today to do the work that you've called us to, God. Not that we would be focused on our own selfishness or our own gain, but submitted to you, God. You would do through us what only you can do and that we would be a shining beacon to the world around us of what it means to follow you and to live lives uh, submitted to you. In your name we pray, amen. Oh,